Hey everyone, welcome back to Quality Matters. Um, we're going to talk about one of my favorite things today. Woohoo, Darcy's always talking about this. I am. And Kyle told me I had to find a new one so I would stop referencing the old one. Yes. <laughs> so I found a case study about a school district that implemented quality management. Woohoo! So I'm very excited. In today's global economy, quality matters. Benjamin Franklin once quipped, the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of low price is forgotten. Quality Matters is here to talk about all things quality. So whether you're looking to improve your business, getting ready for an audit, or dealing with failed inspections, tune in, check us out, then get back to doing work that matters. This was a case study that I found on ASQ. It was written in 2006. And the author is actually, um, or was, he is no longer, I looked it up, the Director of Standards Assessment and Accountability, as well as the Management Review Improvement Action Coordinator at the school district. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's not written by a quality manager. It's written by somebody that was helping to implement quality within the school district. Cool. Um, and his name is Dr. Stephen Miller, if anybody wants to know. And this is for the... Racine Unified School District. I'm not sure if I said that right. It's in uh, Wisconsin. Okay. Okay. So just like our last one, they had to do something because 50% of their students, just under, I think, 50% of their students were economically disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they were having budget cuts. It said forty more than $41 million in budget cuts over a 12-year period. Well, I mean, when you're... Uh, programs provided by uh, tax dollars from the local population. If the local population ain't doing good, you ain't doing good either. Yeah, so that's kind of, you know, I think that was the same story for mm -hmm. the last case study. Budget cuts, more kids, yep. more, I don't want to say more difficult kids, but maybe a wider variety They have a of different students. type of stressors in their life, and it, it can It'll come well, out in behavior and, and educational think, success. You know, whether eco economically disadvantaged or not, you just have a wider variety of students yeah. that come from a huge amount, variety of different backgrounds. I keep saying the word variety. I can't yeah. think of another better <laughs> word. But, um, you know, you have all these different backgrounds. Yeah. And, you know, even within one culture, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. kids are well, raised differently. And it's something like, I mean, if you – if you look at the numbers, and I'm sure someone can get the exact numbers, but roughly speaking, is you've got way more than twice as much of a shot at, you know, moving into the middle class and living that, that kind of American dream, right? If you have a college degree, then if you have a high school, only a high school diploma, and if you don't even have a high school diploma, your chances are like a tenth of of what it would be otherwise. So getting these schools that have a hard time with the funding to do all the stuff everyone else does, mm -hmm. it can create this really negative cycle. To So to see that folks have said, look, maybe we can still do something great here mm -hmm. with what we have, I love it. Because they talk about break the cycle. Education is one of the best tools we have to break those cycles. Mm -hmm. Wherever you come from. I come from a little poor redneck town let me tell you most everyone i went to high school with is still living there or they're stuck in jail i mean it's just kind of the way it goes <laughs> yeah and i mean we don't know a lot about this school district in particular that we're nope. talking about other than what they've told us in the article which is almost 50 percent is economically disadvantaged yep. i know later in the article they talk about the different um cultures that they have within the mm -hmm. school um so in 2003, they implemented a quality management system to work on things like student achievement, engagement, customer satisfaction. Yeah. And in the school district, the customers, I define it as the students and parents. I think in this case study, they define it as the parents only. Right. Um, so fast forward a few years later, four of their schools in the 2005-2006 school year did not make what they call adequate yearly progress. And so that's... Teacher Darcy explained to us what that means. It's just something that the way the state measures how 
your kids are learning, usually okay. through standardized testing. Gotcha. And so if they don't do well on the standardized testing, which I can share my opinions with that if you would like as well, um, then they don't meet adequate yearly progress and they get a lower rating. Okay. So they say, hmm, we're not serving our customers very well. Okay. So in 2003, they had already tried a quality man- quality management thing. But 2005 to six, four of their schools, I don't know how many, I should have looked up how many schools yep. they had total. But then also it looked like more of their students were going that route. Right. So they needed to do something different. Um, <clears throat> so that combined with their previous plan wasn't succeeding in the changing culture because, you know, people yeah. come in, people leave. Yep. Um, so they also realized that the decision-making planning and efforts was not very collaborative and consistent. They okay. weren't sharing the same beliefs and expectations. Mm-hmm. So insert our last episode, ah. the Kepner uh-huh. Trigo approach. All right. Let's hear how this got put to use. Um, well, just how we talked about on the last episode. So they wanted to make sure their improvement process mm-hmm. was a good one. Well, you know, considering the problem you just said that they had, that the collaboration was dead, you know, again, talking about that decision process is a key part of it is you ask everyone what they want or need. Yes. Everyone's voice is heard. Yes. Even and if it's not acted upon, it's heard and valued. And I think think it's important to make sure that the customers know that it's heard and valued. Agreed. Um, it's one thing to send out surveys and feel like you're collecting that data, but then another thing to really make sure that those parents and students felt like they were heard. Agreed. And that their opinion mattered. Agreed. There are I can't say often. There have been times that our children's school district has sent out surveys, and I have just said, eh, why bother? Yeah. It doesn't matter. You get, uh, and and this is kind of a standard thing, the the numbers vary depending on the survey or study that, you know, did the information, but you wind up with a few really satisfied customers and a few really dissatisfied customers, and everyone in the middle is just pencil whipping it. They just want to get it done to say that they did it. And so everyone in the middle, it's kind of like, eh, it's not very accurate. Right. And I say that, like, I'm very involved in our kids' education, super involved in the PTA and, you know, all that jazz. Um, So when it's something like they send out four different calendars and vote on the academic calendar for the year, that's not super important to me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I don't really, I feel like they're going to do what they want to do anyway. So (laughs) I just ignore that. But, you know... Come the COVID-19 thing, and in right. March we left for spring break and never went back to school. Yeah. And then they sent out surveys, you know, a survey for the parents and then one that the students could fill out. Right. Well, I filled that one out yeah. because I wanted my voice to be heard. And with something like that, it's just our district is so large. I can't remember how many thousands Huge. of students we well, the largest we have. in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> and, um the largest in Texas. I mean, come on. This I'm page. not sure it is the largest. It was at one point. It, it's up there. Yeah. It's first or second, I'm pretty sure. But, uh, you know, and there's so many polarizing viewpoints. <laughs> it's it's hard to please everybody. And I know I'm not going to get everything I want, right. and I'm okay with that. But I appreciate that they ask everybody. I agree. And that's what's cool about this process, and I'm sure you'll get into it, Trigo. is that you state your goal. And your goal is not, let's make as many people happy as we possibly can. That should never be the goal. And unfortunately, that winds up being the goal, whether it's in the politics in school, the politics in D.C., or the politics in your little in, in your in your office. Yeah. I mean, it's how many people can we make happy? That shouldn't be your goal. You need to set a good, worthwhile goal and communicate it. Yeah, I think so. Um, so then the case study kind of goes back to in 2003, there was a previous administrator and when they started this process, they kind of went for, um, sep- made the school separate units for ISO certification, which I don't yeah. think is a bad thing. I don't either. I think each school has its own culture and its own way of doing things. Mm-hmm. And I remember we talked about, I think it was when we were doing seven, Stephen Covey's seven mm-hmm. habits 
and he talked about a hotel that he went to. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah. the, the corporate had their mission statement, but then each hotel had their mission mm-hmm. statement, and each department within that hotel mm-hmm. had its mission statement. So I think that's important to understand the uniqueness of each location. Correct. And if you're a business and you have more than one location, yeah, allow the, each location some autonomy. Uh, you know, it's totally different education. I was having a, a talk with a client this morning, and he was saying, you know, we we're talking about welding specs. And he was saying, well, my only customer is really myself because it's our, our sister company, you know, in the next town over that actually uses everything we weld. So we're not really concerned about what spec or the requirement it goes to. I'm like, mm-hmm. well, they've got a customer that they send it to. Like, yeah. come on. It's all part of a whole. So that I, that's goes to Demings. Yes. All the systems being related. Yes. Oh man, I'm getting so smart about this. <laughs> Look at me go. Aren't you so proud of me? I am. I am. <laughs> but yeah, it has to be part of a whole, but definitely don't, don't have one sweeping mission for everyone. So I, I'm, I'm loving the way that they yeah. laid this out. So that's how they started. But then of course, you know, departments got reorganized, yeah. whatever. So, um, so now they're starting a new process. Yep. They identify two groups of customers, their internal customers, which they counted as their principals and teachers. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. External customers, the parents of the students, were Good. the purchasers of education. Ah, My only like that. issue is the students aren't anywhere in there. I don't know if they should be internal. I mean, they're not working for the district, but they're in the school right. on the daily or if they should be considered external, but the students should be counted in there somewhere because they are the customers, and that's how the parents are going to get their information. Yeah. Um, so that's my only issue. Um, so then the office, the central office staff worked on servicing these customers. They created four quality objectives, ah. student achievement, student engagement, um, customer satisfaction, and operational efficiency. Do they give you any details about what criteria they use to measure those objectives? They do. A lot of criteria. Okay. I am very interested in the engagement. I can imagine how they score the others. How do you score engagement? Okay, so I will share that. And for anyone listening, as always, the link to this case study will be in the show notes so you can read their metrics for each of the objectives. But for student engagement, key metrics included... Um, the number of staff trained in responsibility training and okay. control th- theory. Okay. Um, their attendance rate. Okay. Truancy rate. Okay. Suspension rate. Yeah. Expulsion rate. Mm. Graduation rate. Good. And student activity participation rate for things like extracurricular activities. And they specify, you know, from baseball to chess. Very cool. No, I like that because you can set, uh, you can weight each of those to a certain degree and assign so many positive or negative points to each. I, I think that's fantastic. So that, and then um, for Very customer cool. satisfaction, they sent out an annual survey um, with ten statements that, mm-hmm. and they were statements, not questions. So I imagine there was like, I highly agree, I strongly agree, right. I agree. You know, those yeah. kind of different ratings. Um, and it ended with overall, I would give my child's school a grade of A, B, C, D, or F. Hmm. So that's um, what they came up with. So their results, they were excited about this, as I imagine anybody would be. In 2006, their management system was registered to ISO 9001 2000. <laughs> um, it was a much simpler than what we have today. And they had no. Nonconformities. Awesome. When they were registered. So they were excited about that. Um, their student achievement, it has all the results here. I'm not going to yeah. read it to you. Um, but that was one of their objectives. Well, we can all imagine we've got several testing means that it's easy to score good or bad. Right. And it, they went into like particular mm-hmm. cultural groups, you know, Asian students, yeah. Hispanic students, English language learners. So Gotcha. In different grade level, you mm-hmm. know, so that's pertinent to them. They did better. We'll say that. <laughs> um, for student engagement, they well, talked about attendance rate increased while, tru- while truancy and suspension decreased. I would tend to make sense. So, But here's – people get frustrated when I tell them to, uh, to measure it, to track it. Like, well, why? I know what's going on. 
right? Well, once your company gets beyond four or five people, you actually don't know what's going on as much as you'd like to think well, you, you do. you need to be able to share that data mm -hmm. with people. And if you measure it, because we're people have certain psychological things in, in common with one another, if we know it's getting measured, we are more likely to do it. Agreed. What gets measured gets done. Yes. It's not just an old adage. It's true. true. <laughs> <laughs> um for customer satisfaction, I will read these because they're quicker and easier. It says 88% of elementary schools per survey question are performing at or above minimum expectations. That's pretty good. Okay. And this is kind of funny when you first read it, but then they have um, some more information to make it sound better. Okay. 46% of middle schools per question are performing at or above minimum expectations, which is low, Yeah. but then they note that that's 5% higher than last year. Okay. So we're showing improvement. Yeah. And the same thing with this, 44% of high schools per question are performing at or above minimum expectations, which is 7% higher than the previous year. Hey, go so, in the right direction. So they're showing improvement. Okay, and the last... Um, what do we call these objectives? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the last objective was operational efficiency. I thought you would be really excited about this part. Oh, this is my, uh, I spent a lot of time on a, a whole other podcast this morning talking with someone about efficiency. Okay. It is so incredibly important. Well, they're talking about the number of nonconformities. Okay. And so the number of nonconformities in 0405 school year was 91 nonconformities. And it increased to 134 in 05 and 06, which they were excited about uh -huh, that's what I was because, gonna say. you know, the staff, the employees are on board with problem resolution. Mm -hmm. They're like, we're ready to find these problems and to fix these problems. That, ah, that's so key. People can't be afraid to raise your hand and say, this isn't right. We should fix this. And if you can give them, and I'm going to bet these folks did, but if you can give them just a little bit of a say in what that fix is, you can completely transform the culture. Completely in a snap. And I think that's a new way of thinking in our world today. Yeah. People just want to say, hey, there's a problem. There's a problem. Fix this. I right. don't like this. But, you know, taking responsibility and saying, mm -hmm. hey, there's a problem and I have this idea to fix it. Maybe they'll use it. Maybe they won't. But at least it drew attention to the problem. It does. And if you're also responsible for suggesting a fix, it changes the way you it's define received. the problem. Yeah, and the way it's received. Yeah. Hey, let me put in a plug real quick. If you want some tools to help your business do that, we have those available at uh, TexasQualityAssurance.com. We've got a little thing called a good catch card. It's free. Totally free. Just go download it. Check it out. It's exactly what we're talking about. Okay. Continue. So... Um, <laughs> Then in uh, the 05 06 school year, they had 69 nonconformities addressed and closed. Okay. Compared with just 47 in the previous year. I love it. So, um, and then nine nonconformities were added to improvement actions already in place. Cool. So, you know, they were excited mm -hmm. to implement this and to grow. Mm -hmm. um, I did go to their website looking for some information on this. I didn't really see any. Mm -hmm. I know that Dr. Miller, who wrote this case study, is no longer there. As a matter of fact, the department that he was the director of is no longer a department. I'm assuming when I click yeah. on departments, it's not listed under yeah. department. So I clicked on the closest thing, and he was not the director. There was an interim director. Well, um, I've seen it happen in a few organizations where they had a good program uh, in place maybe five, ten years ago, and it had been had been running for some period of time. But then they kind of achieved a happy status quo. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the earlier edition of 9001 was not very keen on continual improvement. 2008 and especially 2015 really pushed that continual improvement piece a lot more. Mm-hmm. Um, so what these folks do, they just kind of hit a good, happy status quo, and then they just stay there. And as long as no customer is demanding the certificate, uh, they'll see it as a waste of resources to maintain that certification. Mm -hmm. And to maintain employees, to maintain the exactly. quality management system. Exactly. And if you get a good status quo, 
it can take several years for it to erode because you put a good system in place. You know, you, you built a good foundation. It's going to take time for it to erode. I am not advocating abandoning your quality management system. I'm just saying if you do a good job, it'll last for a while. Yeah, I was um, – I agree. And it's so sad because so many times I find – where school districts have started this or did it at one point, but as soon as, you know, uh, employees change, right, then it's kind of yeah. pushed to the wayside because it's more about what I think instead of what's best yeah. for the, the organization, whether it be a school district. Um, I was looking in here somewhere. It talks about who they had put in charge, and I thought that that was – important because they weren't just quality managers they right. had other jobs within the district mm -hmm. which i think is important because a quality manager doesn't necessarily have to be a full-time person no. especially when it's not like a shop Correct. type environment even then um I, I think it's truly best that it's not a full-time quality manager for the most part. Uh, the original idea, say original, an earlier idea in the 9001 standard is what they call a quality management representative. Yes, we've talked about that before. Yes. And so somebody that's on the admin team that represents quality, and that's not necessarily their full-time job. And that's what I was before, and I, I would say that I was very successful in my position. But my, mm -hmm. my uh, original first primary duties were – uh, I was the computer geek. I was the systems administrator that happened to go out into the shop and, you know, help with this stuff. Yeah. So I can't find it. I know it's in there somewhere, but trying to glance through it. So I think that's important to know for school districts. If this is something you're interested in working towards, you don't have to have a new employee with a new salary. No. Take somebody that's got this kind of brain and can think about yes. these kind of things um, and not just one person, create a team yeah. of people that already have a job there and ask them to do this to help make your school district better. All right. Now, Darcy, since you were a teacher and... Oh, no. I feel like I'm under the gun. You are. So you were a teacher for almost a decade. Uh -huh. And, you know, that's what you went to school for. And you even uh, have your master's, mm -hmm. right? In okay. educational administration. I and never used that no, degree, but, but I got it. Uh, you did at least get uh, your, um, I forget the term here, license, registration, something. You were cleared to be a principal if you'd been right. able to get the job. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So if there are any school districts out out there mm -hmm. listening or any parents who have school kids that are going to a struggling school mm -hmm. especially in these economically disadvantaged mm -hmm. areas right mm -hmm. and this could be inner city this could be out in the boonies either mm -hmm. way i mean or it could be a well-to-do school district. it could yeah so what would be some key benefits that you can think of that a, a quality management system would give i I always go to the budget. That's the bottom line. Um, and you'll know we've only done two case studies regarding education on here. And mm -hmm. both of them were because there were budget cuts. Yeah. And they had to find a way to do things more efficiently. So you're and telling so, me quality processes save money. Yes. Okay. That's what I'm saying. It's not, a, it's not an added cost or a luxury. It no. saves money. No. Okay. Yes, 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 okay, yes. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, you know, and when you think that a school district can save a million dollars or two million dollars, mm -hmm. what what can you do for the kids with that money? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I know our school district in particular is always begging for bus drivers. Yeah. Maybe Imagine we if you could, could pay your bus drivers more. We could more. pay them better. Get more, yeah. And we could get more bus drivers. You um, could build a really cool football stadium. Well, I think they do that anyway uh, because athletics be has priority. the booster clubs that can, you know, raise money for those kinds of things. Unfortunately, transportation departments do no. not have booster clubs. No. Um, so I think saving that money and giving it back to the kids. Oh, I'm going to start tearing up. It's something I'm super passionate about. Okay. Um, so we saved a million dollars. What good could that do for these kids? I mean, it depends on the area you're in and what your kids need. I books are super important. You're supposed to have small reading groups in your classroom and not every school has enough sets of books for those yeah. groups. You have to share them. Technology for your schools. Well, you taught at a uh, school that didn't, you know, 
I have the most affluent students. And how much of your own money did you spend on books for your classroom? Unfortunately, I think that's expected wherever you are, whether you're in a wealthy district or not. Um, if you're in a school that has wealthier parents, then you can get the parents to donate that right. money. Um, I've seen a image going around on social media, you know, here's a classroom funded by the government, here's a classroom funded by a teacher. Unfortunately, I think that's just expected. And, you know, unfortunately, I'm okay with that to help the kids. But um, when I think about their resources, and this was many, many years ago, we adopted a new writing curriculum. Okay, that's great. I really liked the writing curriculum. But then we had to read excerpts from different books. Ah. And we didn't have those books always available that the writing curriculum referenced right so you paid for this curriculum probably paid a lot of money for the training for the teachers and dedicated lots of resources but then I mean, eventually you couldn't do it it yeah. was acquired um so just things like that being able to buy the whole set or being able to buy a set for each teacher so that the teachers don't have yeah. to share what is needed let me ask you this then if they had had the funds to purchase a set for each teacher with everything you needed or at least enough that you could adequately share as a grade level, how much more uh, effective would you and your co-teachers have been with this program? Do you think you could have done a better job for the kids? I think that's kind of an unfair question because a teacher that loves their job is going to be effective with whatever resources they have. Okay. Um, Let's assume I that not everyone not, loves it as much as you do. Not having to worry about those things allows the teacher to focus more on engaging lessons for their students. But you just stand and there and we can give a lesson. also focus on, um, I don't want to say remediation, but, you know, what our students didn't get and right. how to improve our teaching. Well, that's what I mean, because you're not just standing there, you know, reciting a lesson, right? No. You're not just there in the front of the classroom. No. And so if you've got all these other worries going on in the back of your head, you're not well, going to do as good and, with each individual and same student. Thing with the kids. If they have worries going on in the back of their head, you know, there's free lunch and free breakfast programs, but what about at night when they go home for dinner? Yeah. What if that's not available? And I know there are some school districts that send home meals for the weekends or whatever. Um, so that, or, you know, free after school activities. So that, I mean, for lack of a better word, like a daycare, but make it an extracurricular school activity so that the parents don't have to worry about paying for daycare. And it's something enriching to the student. Maybe parents can't afford to pay for their kids to be on a little league baseball team. That costs a lot of money. Yeah. So if a school district gets a million dollars back, could they afford bats and balls and helmets and things for kids to just go out and have fun. No, you're not part of a little league. You're not right. going to go to championship, but you can go learn teamwork and how to play baseball and have fun with your friends after school while your parents don't have to worry about paying for daycare. And all of this could be done with funds that are currently available. You have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll stop it's there. It's making me cry. I'll stop there. But I really want to bring home the point that this is what quality is about. It's not about checking some dang checkbox. It is truly about impacting the lives of people. It is. If we can and do... I, you know, I've been thinking about this because this is something I want our business to get into so much. Um, and I, I, it made me think about when I was teaching and we would get paid for after school tutoring when it came state testing time. Well, what about the whole rest of the year? Yeah. You know, there are kids that need it yeah. all year long. And I did it because they needed it. But that's time away from my family yep. that I took, which is fine. I did it because they needed it. And mm -hmm. I have a supportive husband that helped care for the kids <laughs> while I was doing that. Um, but, you know, things like that. Maybe you can get a paraprofessional in in the mornings and the afternoons to offer yeah. some and just just to come sit and read with the kids. That makes a huge difference. I can think of ways to spend the money. <laughs> if your school district <laughs> wants to work on the quality management system, I'll help you spend that. And I'm sure that your teachers in your district have yep. ways they can spend that money. We have a whole decision process that they can use to find good ways to do it. We do. So I'm going to throw in a little <laughs> plug. Kyle might cut this out. I don't know. This is something that we are super passionate about and we want to get into. And we have talked about maybe doing it for a small school district for free to see 
how it works for you yeah. and then to kind of spread the word and work our way up from there. Yeah. Because we are super, Kyle's super passionate about quality. I'm passionate about education and we know what it can do for any organization. Yep. So if you are a school district, if mm-hmm. you know somebody in a school district, you want to talk yeah. to us about having this done, call us. Well, I think this is a cool intersection. I try hard not to plug the business on the podcast because that's, that's not what it's about. But this is a really awesome intersection because Texas Quality Assurance is all about saving time and energy for what matters most. And this is where I'm going to get emotional <laughs> um, because there are so many things that we put our time and we put our energy to that aren't the most important in our in our, in our daily lives. Mm-hmm. And quality management quality's everywhere quality matters it's mm-hmm. everywhere this is a perfect intersection and one more i know we're super <laughs> over time one more thing because i have been researching this this week trying to find school district we could contact and talk to you about this but um then i thought well this is a really bad time with the covid and schools mm-hmm. are trying to figure out online learning and a lot of schools are spending a lot of money to you know create yep. these online learning programs and, you know, the kids have to check in for attendance to get the funding from yep. TEA. And then I thought, this is the perfect time. Because what if you didn't have to rely on that funding from TEA? I'm sure they do. Like, right. I think I all their funding. Um, but it's the perfect time. When you're looking for ways to save money, mm-hmm. this is the perfect time mm-hmm. to do this. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. if you've got a quality management company offering to do it for your school district for free – Jump on that. (laughs) And that's all. I'm done. (laughs) All right. Thank you all. If you would like to uh, message Darcy personally, I'm going to leave her information on the show notes. Feel free to uh, to email her and, and uh, chat about uh, any of this stuff. We, we really do, really do love all of this. We really are passionate about it. And we just want to spread the word that all that matters. All right. Thanks, y'all. Hey guys, this is Darcy with Quality Matters. We really appreciate you listening. And if you enjoy it, we invite you to subscribe. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, anywhere you listen to your podcast. Subscribe, comment, leave us a review. We're happy to hear from you.